first of 10 talks run over 10 months over this year. Um, we're doing this because it's the 10 year anniversary of the Forgiveness Project, something I started and founded 10 years ago, and it's absolutely extraordinary to me that it's still in existence, to be perfectly honest with you. And the only reason for that is that there's something about the stories that grabs people, that heals people, that helps people. Um, and the interest in this project is, you know, from day one, really, has been so phenomenal that it's led me and pulled me in many directions. Um, so I think a lot of you probably know about the Forgiveness Project, but a lot of you don't as well. So very briefly, we, what we do is we collect and share, we examine and unpick concepts of forgiveness um, through the real stories of victims and perpetrators of crime and violence. And the overall aim is not to preach or prescribe, um, but literally just to get people to think. That's really a very simple aim. And we do that within our prison program and our schools work, in all the um, events that we put on, the trains that we run, and the stories that we collect. And one of the stories um, that we collect is that of Jim Faree and that Dapa Afadini. And so I was just um, absolutely overwhelmed and delighted when I actually saw this film. It's, it's very moving, it's very much in keeping with the work of the Forgiveness Project. First, I'm first going to come to you, Emma. What what inspired you about this story? Why this story? I guess at a, at a deeper level, I am searching for stories that give me hope, that challenge me, that hope is possible, that hope exists, um, that even in the most dire circumstances. Uh, we shouldn't give up hope. So I'm speaking as a Palestinian, somebody from Gaza, who believes in human ability to change and that peace is possible. But when the reality is so dark and stark, um, I guess that's that's one aspect. That, as I said, at, at a deeper level, I met Gina Litlaber ten years ago at the conference center when I was a participant. I was not a filmmaker then. And I was so struck by just seeing them standing <coughs> and speaking uh, from the same, uh, even from the same microphone. And I just couldn't believe my eyes and uh, my ears. Um, so it stuck with me, stayed with me the story, and, um, and the opportunity uh, came for me to make the film later. I remember um, Jin saying to me that when she first met Lit Lapa, it would have been so much easier if he being the devil with horns. Um, so in other words, it's easier to demonize. And I'm very struck by a line in the film when the Lapa talks about, well, you know, the lightning bolt of forgiveness and how it opens up a whole new world. <coughs> so in that sense, you know, we know how transformative forgiveness can be, but can it actually heal a community? <coughs> I'd like to think the answer is yes. Um, partly again because of this quest for hope that I have. Um, you did mention this to me before as a question that you want to ask and I've been searching for the answer and I found myself just looking at the, um, if you like, the lack of forgiveness. If it didn't exist, if it didn't present itself. Uh, I can't see a way forward. I can't see that it would, that communities could find a way to repair the relationships. Um, so I feel where forgiveness can find a way, can present itself, it does have the power of healing and the power of repairing relationships. But it's not a one-way system, it's a two-way system. And often uh, one, one side feels the victim 
And if we look deeper, it's almost always both sides are victims at some level. Uh, and so for me, forgiveness needs a sense of also mutual apology, mutual recognition, uh, inward looking rather than defensiveness and demonization and I am the victim. Um, so that's what I would offer. Yeah, I think that's what came through in the movie early on in the movie where um, Jenny was saying, I was perceiving Let Lapa as an evil person. And Let Lapa was saying that in order for him to have made the decisions he made, he needed to see um, the protagonist in a certain light. And then when we come down to the personal level and talk about the power of people sitting with each other's energy and sharing perceptions and feelings and learning about each other, then all those edges fall away, don't they? And that's what we saw in the latter part of the movie where Ginny's saying she could reach for the humanity in the other. And then, of course, through that empathic response and understanding, and then there's a state of forgiveness ar arrived at, rather than thinking earlier on in a piece, or shall I or shan't I forgive? But it was more like it seemed a state that, that, that parties came to as a result of their conversation. And so if we play with that idea about harm being caused because almost the humanity of the other is able to be suspended because of a prejudicial thought or an assumption made about other groups, then uh, I find that a helpful analysis really. And I'm minded, mindful of something that Bernadette Devlin used to do in Northern Ireland. She would go to just any street and knock on doors and say, is there a mother in the house? So she'd be thrown to something beyond an affinity to a tribe or a religion or whatever, and, and seeing a, a commonality of humanity. Thank you. Um, well, the one thing that I have got in common with St. Ethelberg is, is that I was nearly destroyed by an IRA bomb as well. Um, I was caught up in an IRA bombing at Victoria Station back in 1991, and it was the last time that a bomb was left in a uh, little bit in the station, because after that point they were all removed from the station. Um, I went through a very dark and lonely time after the bombing. I lost my leg and I had a lot of injuries to my other leg as well, and spent many years in rehabilitation. And I was an occupational therapist before, um, and it felt a very uncomfortable position for me to be sitting in a wheelchair and on the receiving end of this therapy. For you, who was never, and no one was ever identified, it, there's a, a, a huge question mark there as to who that person was. And I'm wondering, how do you, can you forgive if there's no one to apologise, if there is simply no one there? I was fortunate in that I never felt any need for revenge. I was struck by the feeling of what's gone wrong if I've been attacked in this way. What do I need to put right? And um, I still feel more responsibility for putting things right than for trying to make things worse. Um, so I feel hugely blessed that um, I've never felt challenged by um, any need for revenge or um, payback. Uh, and I feel hugely blessed that I've been able to work with people who've been part of the IRA and who were in the Mays prison and um, I've been able to get to know them really well and hear their side of the story. And that's been um, the most healing part, I think, for me, that I've been able to hear exactly the backgrounds that they came from and, and I share that part of where things went wrong with them too. It hasn't always been an easy journey though, has it? I mean, there were struggles along the way. <laughs> you could say that. You could say that. <laughs> no, that's a kind way of putting it. Thank you, Marina. Um, I think the choice and the need to forgive is a constant management program, really, uh, an internal management program, because um, I can get triggered and I can get angry and I can get upset. Um, and I have to keep managing myself um, just to check where I am. But I think the main part of forgiveness is when we develop a better relationship with ourselves and that we realise that we are all capable of all things. And 
we are capable of hate and we are capable of love. And let's hope that we learn to manage those two better. I connected with, I met Little Arpa and Jin back in 2009 when I was out in South Africa as part of the Sustainable Peace Project. And with Jin being a physiotherapist and me being an occupational therapist, we talked a lot about rehabilitation and about getting our lives back. Um, and it was lovely for me to be able to share my story with Jin because of course she'd lost her daughter and I'd never been able to unpick the terrible effects that my bombing had had on my mum because um, she'd never been able to articulate it very well. But she, like Jin, had to take early retirement um, in order to come to terms with the awful impact that it had had on her life. Um, so I've seen Jin in the car for several times since, and I feel that I've become very close to Jin particularly, um, and I have huge admiration for both of them. And I got to know Lit Lapper particularly, and invited him to come to Britain, and I took him to 36 six forms in six weeks to share his story. And we also showed a film of Jin speaking. We also came here, incidentally, to St Ethelburgers, so that was nine years ago. And a lot of interesting things came up with the students, and I'd just like to tell you what one little cameo. Do you um, think that Jin did the right thing to forgive Let Lapper? And immediately a girl in the front row, who was a Muslim, she had a hijab on, said yes, because if she hadn't forgiven, she would have suffered more than him. And then a boy at the back said, when you look at the world and all the problems that there are, um, and we've got plenty going on at the moment, they are actually setting an example for what is a possible way forward. So the girl was thinking on a personal level, and he was thinking of the implications of society. And then I said, well, actually, Jin forgave because she's a Christian and Jesus' example on the cross. Do you think you need to be a Christian or a Muslim or a believer in God to forgive? And the teacher jumped up and said, no, I'm an atheist and I value things like forgiveness and try to apply it. And then a boy at the back said, it comes from within. It comes from within. And we had a very interesting discussion with these six formers that we all experience this inner struggle, we all interpret it in different ways, but there's a commonality there. Jin is a Christian and Let Lapa is an atheist, and yet after that deep experience, there they are together. And what is it that brings them together? So this, to me, is a new dimension. We do a lot of interfaith work, but often with believers and non-believers, there's a sort of standoff. But I think they are pointing a way forward on a deeper level. To me, forgiveness, whatever, it's about relationships and restoring relationships, and that's what's needed in our communities. You know, all sorts of different things go on. So that, to me, is what this is about, restoring relationships in our own community in a simple way, not just in big issues out there. Thank you very much, Hard, and that really reminds me of the fact that I think with the Forgiveness Project, we share very extreme stories, but it's always occurred to me that those stories actually shed light on our own sort of more minor grievances, if you like, and, and seem to help people to formulate new and fresh perspectives for their own lives. And that's certainly what the film does. I'm interested in your experience of trying to get religious people that are trapped in tribalism out of their tribalism. Thank you for that. Um, I don't know if I'm very qualified to answer that, but I would just say that discussing forgiveness makes me feel like I belong to the tribe. And I don't think, um, I can see where you're coming from about um, us and them 
um, being a big element of many religions, but God doesn't talk about us and them. It's all about, we are all the children of God, and that doesn't um, provide for separation or for division. But I think the Forgiveness Project is great for bringing the tribe back together. The only response I give to what you said would be that I think hearing each other's stories of pain um, actually breaks the cycle. Um, and this is what happens in the film. They both heard each other's stories of pain. Um, the, one thing, <coughs> the one thing I probably would add is within conflict areas, the religious leadership is still um, incapable of um, <coughs> preaching what their religion should uh, and they know at heart should be preaching. I can speak as a Muslim that the Islamic uh, text is very clear on forgiveness. And if you watch the Imam and the pastor, uh, it's the Imam who led the, uh, the journey of forgiveness and reached out to the pastor. Um, but we all know the reality of the world today and how uh, bad the situation is. So sadly, you can't speak for religion in this forum. In the making of the film, um, I was hoping not to uh, make forgiveness look like a tool of religion or only uh, that has got the religious aspect. I was uh, happy that the relationship was uh, a spiritual atheist, uh, with Jim being Christian of background. And with me and Howard being of religious background as a Muslim and as a Christian. But I was trying to do two things. One is to uh, to say to those who are non-religious that forgiveness is possible and is not only Christian or Muslim or Jewish. But also to say to the, the religious who feel that we want to claim forgiveness, so speak up, so speak up. Um, but as a, as a filmmaker, I can only uh, trigger conversations and debates and hopefully inspire positiveness. Sorry, um, I forgive them, I'm looking back parents. Uh, not because I wanted to forgive, but that, that's, that was the last things to do because I was almost going to die. Uh, because I was an alcoholic addicted and drugs, because I couldn't forgive him. And uh, uh, you know, they, we grew up together. And uh, when I learned that the one who came back, parents, and it took nine years dealing with anger and bitterness and the resentment. And um, to try to bring my life back, uh, I became Christian in, in 2003. Uh, I wanted just to practice Christianity. Then I wanted, because I was reading the Word of God and and I was hearing a voice telling me that you will only be healed when you forgive. Then I said, I have tried everything. Let me just do it because I'm hearing this voice, even if I don't agree. Because I was saying, how can you forgive the man who killed your parents? And I said, Let, I have tried everything. Let me just, because I, it was too much hearing that voice. Then I said, let me just try this, and I think I'm gonna try. Then I tried it, and I, that day I decided to forgive her. I had a great peace in my heart. Then I went even to find a man, just to make sure that I forgive him. I went to find him in, in Rwanda. Then I met him, and then we started uh, conferences, organized, organized of conference on forgiveness, and uh, I was totally healed. Then they said also, Jamie forgives, but because we have, we are, she's a Christian, no. Mm -hmm. She forgave because, you know, well, you can say she put the Christianity in action. Because if you say she's a Christian, that's why she forgives, or all Christians should forgive. Mm -hmm. Maybe Christians should not against me because I forgive. Mm -hmm. No. Also, I can say that forgiveness is for you, not for the offender. Mm -hmm. Like Jenny, forgiveness helped her. Then it's good you called it Beyond Forgiving mm -hmm. because it's a mm -hmm. very good mm -hmm. title because she was not mm -hmm. forgiving only, she also helped the offender to get healed. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what we have to do. The whole Forgiveness Project came from the point of view of wanting to spread these stories and get them out there as far as possible. And 
to use people like Sue to go and talk to people and to run workshops. And this is happening all over. Um, in, and the exhibition, the F word, was recently in Libya and places like that. So that is part of a repairing, but it's also a part of the prevention. Because as we know, the cycle of violence is a cycle. So, I, and I'm just a passionate believer in the power of the personal story. So I think that journalists, academics, politicians have very little sway, actually. I think you're absolutely right, empathy is key. And you get empathy by hearing these stories of Jin and Lapa, by hearing people like Sue. Could I just say one yeah. thing? Um, I think the saddest line in the film is that Lapa said it was necessary or he thought it was necessary to do what he did. And with it, some of the people I've met, they've said how if this doesn't end, then sacrifices will still have to be made. And they're talking about human sacrifices. Um, the, the way to take the politics or the, this cycle out is to see that um, sanctions can be made or changes can be made without using human lives to be the necessary targets or to be the sacrificial lambs because um, lives are for living, they're not to be used as sacrifices in this way. Um, what is helpful do you think in the forgiveness process? Um, it's hard to identify um, which bit's which, I think. Um, I think there's a huge separation at the time of trauma where the the spirit or the soul or whatever separates from the body in some way because the body is too, it, the, the danger and the overwhelm that happens to the body is too much to bear. And um, I think the whole process of reconnecting with your spiritual life and reconnecting with your soul comes down the line when your body knows that it's still in one piece but it can also start to trust again, and it can start to love again, and it can start to feel again, and that comes through human contact and through connections with other people. So I would agree with you completely about on the visceral level, um, because we go into our heads at the point of survival, trying to work out why has this happened and what do I need to do now and we do all the cognitive stuff trying to understand what's happened to us but it's some time after that I call it jet lag of the soul because we go through the, the physical um, mechanics of the rehabilitation of getting our bodies working again but then, and then there's this terrible disconnect between our lives before and who we are now because it's almost as if um, the body goes into collapse at the point of trauma and it's waiting for the final blow, but then it carries on surviving, but without the sort of fabric within it um, to really connect to the spiritual level. Um, I think there's, there's huge um, developments going on now uh, as far as the recovery from trauma is concerned, but it really is about the body coming back to life and being warmed back to life. Um, as an occupational therapist, I did a lot of work with children who had dyspraxia, who didn't know where their bodies <coughs> were, and they didn't know about spatial awareness or about reciprocation of the body, or about crossing the midline and all sorts of things like that. Um, there's a huge amount of work to be done. Um, there's a huge amount of ancient wisdom there with the Aboriginals and connecting with the ground, there's a vast body of work there to be done. Um, but we find our healing through the body as well. Um, and at that point, we can start inviting the, the, the soul to come back to the body. But it's, it's almost like we get an invitation to join the experience of life again. So I find, it, find forgiveness a very complex thing. And anyone who wants to mediate and to fear uh, come to help, they really need to be trained with the right people in the right place and know how to handle it. I would never say to anyone who doesn't feel that forgiveness is right for them that they should forgive. But I have been in a situation where, I've, as a friend, I have advised the person to watch out for the anger, not to eat themselves from inside. It's absolutely fine for me, for anyone. 
not to forgive the good we should do. But I think what John Gordon said, it's a, I mean, this, this is my word, I think you've said it, it's a selfish act. Forgiveness for me is a selfish act. And someone once said, if you don't forgive, it's like you take the poison and you expect the other person to die. So it's just important to watch out for one's own well-being. Uh, because if we don't forgive, we could be consuming ourselves from inside. Um, at the end of it, you're looking for justice, you're looking for you know, revenge, you're looking for a sense of closure. But just to ensure that at, when you get to that point that you're wishing to get, you don't find that you actually lost yourself. But it's how you do it, how you say it, it's very tricky and has to be very sensitively handled. Um, but if that case can be made, it could help the person too. But also a sense of, sorry, I know I'm going on, a sense of repentance, a sense of acknowledgement from the other side, whether that other side exists, uh, or we don't know who they are in Sue's case. Uh, all of these elements are important uh, to create the circumstances, the connection for change to happen.